It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Caitlin Thaney. Caitlin is director of Mozilla Science Lab, an open science initiative for the Mozilla Foundation focused on innovation, best practices, and skills training for research. Caitlin is an advisor to the UK government, serves as director for Datakind UK, and is the founding co-chair for the Strata Conference Series in London on Big Data. Today, Caitlin will present Making the Web Work for Science, in which she'll discuss how we can better work together to advance the mission of more open, collaborative, web-enabled science, and how we can influence the culture of science by demonstrating new and open ways to conduct research on the web. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Caitlin to the podium. Caitlin. Good afternoon, everybody. So it is a distinct honor and pleasure to be at RIT. Uh, I know some of you who I've met with this morning know that Rochester is my hometown. Uh, we grew up not very far from here. So it's a real pleasure to be here to speak to you all about some of the work that we do at Mozilla. For today's uh, discussion, I really wanted to look at not only some of the thinking that we've applied in the last year and a half, a little bit more than that, to create the science program at Mozilla, showcase some of the things that we're working on and ways that we're trying to further engagement when it comes to bringing the open source world and research world together to learn together, but also then to open it up to a, a dialogue afterwards. So please feel free to save those questions. We'll have some time at the end. But to give you a little bit of background, Mozilla is more commonly known for some of its work in the browser space. Um, in the bottom, bottom corner there, I don't know how many people here have ever used Mosaic. Show of hands. Come on, we're in a software engineering. OK, we've got a couple there. Uh, so Mozilla has its uh, history rooted in one of the first web browsers, Mosaic. That's where the M-O-Z comes from, though Mosaic is spelled slightly differently. Uh, and really looking at how we can start to weave in disruption as well as ownership for that experience to users so it's not uh, another large tech company that's dictating our experiences on the web. Really this idea that the internet and the web should be ours, that we should have the ability to really make that into something that is better suited to our needs. So in the last five years or so, Mozilla has existed for quite some time, but in the last five years or so on the foundation component, or on the foundation side where I work, we've been looking at various use cases, whether it's in data journalism and in news, and the Knight Foundation is heavily funding some of the work to explore how to apply some of these principles when it comes to the web and the connectivity and accessibility and openness that comes through it, um, how to apply that to that community to help advance those initiatives, as well as looking at ways that we can shape education and opportunities for youth. And so the icon that you see there next to the Firefox logo is a program that we have called WebMaker that looks at ways that we can bring together cultural learning opportunities, after school programs, things that can get kids making on the web and also outside of classrooms to help further the ability for us to push things like digital literacy and that environment to them beyond. Now, why would Mozilla get into a space like science? The Science Lab, we launched that back in June of 2013 um, with some support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Uh, if anyone here listens to Radio Lab, the podcast, uh, you may have heard Alfred P. Sloan Foundation cited. I see some smiles in the audience. Um, and the work that we were brought in to do was to take the identity of Mozilla, not necessarily as just a software engineering organization, but more so as one that has really pushed forward this idea of open source, of open innovation, of building out best practice for the community, of really instilling these values into everything that we do, both in shaping the technology that we use in our everyday, uh, everyday lives and also professionally, but also to look at what we can do to help heighten involvement and engagement um, for those around the world. And focusing specifically on applying those values to scientific research where we are still seeing, despite you know, even my own personal work for almost 10 years in this, we're still seeing significant bottlenecks that are keeping us from advancing scientific research in a way that the technology should have pushed us, pushed us past long before. And so our work at the Science Lab is to really support communities where they already exist. I mean, I'm sure that 
You know, many of you have been either aware of or involved in some of the advances when it comes to open data, both within the sciences and outside of it for open access, some of the tool development, scientific software. There is a myriad of different projects out there that are really pushing these things forward. This is not a new idea by any stretch of the imagination, but finding a means to help collectively move that work forward so that we're not creating additional bottlenecks and, and roadblocks for each other is something that we strive to do at the Science Lab. And I'll tell you a little bit more about it, but to give you a bit of background as to some of the areas in which we're working Focusing originally on you know, the fact that this is a really cool time to be involved in science and in research. I mean, you've got from the top left-hand corner, I mean, discovering the Higgs boson, being able to process significant amounts of information to be able to even look at some of those anomalies in the data and, uh, and doing that at you know, a level that CERN has um, with the Large Hadron Collider. Um, we've got in the top right-hand corner, um, you know, efforts to not only sequence the human genome, which seemed really revolutionary even just a few years ago, but being able to have research collaborations that span over 400 different uh, scientists and excessive amounts of information to be able to look at better understanding um, our, our genomes itself. And even in the bottom left-hand corner, looking at the advances in astronomy. The new telescope that's being built in Chile, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, is going to bring us in, I believe, 2019. They keep pushing the date. This happens in science quite frequently. I'm sure many here have you know, had shifting timelines. Uh, but with the advances with the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, being able to get to petascale astronomy. I mean, this is so much data that even astronomers that are even that are up to speed with some of the latest technologies are trying to figure out new means so that they can make most use of that information. And my favorite is in the bottom right hand corner, really trying to democratize this entire process. Not only through advances in citizen science, really getting research not only outside of universities, but also into hands of people around the world that may not otherwise have access to it. You know, really having those distributed forms of data collection and analysis and also communication so that the way that we understand the world, and to me that is really at the heart of what research is all about, that that really is being not only communicated, but there's a participatory element there as well. And we've seen this with synthetic biology, we've seen this through other citizen science efforts, um, even now being carried up to levels such as the National Institutes of Health and the White House as well. And the web has really helped transform this. I don't need to tell the audience here that in the last you know, 10 to 20 years, our experiences online have changed, right? I mean, I don't know when was the last time anyone here used uh, the yellow pages to try to find something online or thought twice before purchasing something and looking at the rating system that had been pulled together by not only various stars, but reviews, et cetera. You know, the way that we interact in educational, uh, educational environments as well as just even knowledge discovery has rapidly transformed as well as accelerated in a way that the web has really helped to, to add. And we've seen advances in power, performance, and scale. A lot of the work that we do in, uh, at the Science Lab and communities that we work with are, many of them are coming out of high performance computing where we have increased resources to work in distributed environments and also with much more power. And so thinking about what we can do to continue to apply that to various areas and, and really acknowledging the fact that these advances were something that didn't necessarily even exist in a way that was accessible to broader research groups outside of certain pockets five to 10 years ago. But for all of those advances, our current systems are designed, unfortunately, to create friction, despite their original intentions. If you think of when scientific publication began in 1665 with the Royal Society's Journal Philosophical Transactions, the, in the initial idea behind it was to be able to write down your work and to be able to share that with your colleagues and with your peers. It was a knowledge sharing system. Even things like citation and indexing was a way of categorizing and organizing information to help make things more efficient. And then humans got into the process and competitive interests started to layer into that dictated by things that are very, very in innately human, you know, funding, job security, et cetera. And so what can we do to help move that forward? I like to think of it as the current state of science as a clogged calcified pipe. Don't know if any of you remember like the Drano commercials where they showed you that really kind of nasty pipe in the, in the mix. 
You know, when we first started, when I was at Creative Commons a number of years ago, looking at the, the state of research and, and working with a number of different scientists across dif different disciplines to say, what are the main stopping points for your work? Everyone thought that just because they saw papers were still being published, patents were still being filed, data was still being generated, as a real success that the system was working, outside of realizing that some just have a fire hose at the beginning of that pipe. You know, when it comes to having more funding to be able to throw at that, that doesn't mean necessarily we're doing things as efficiently as possible. You know, and looking at the outputs, there is still a significant amount that we can be doing to build that, uh, build that better. And one of the quotes that I like to reflect on from Cass Sunstein, who's a, a legal scholar, but also has been looking at scholarly communications, uh, is that traditions last not because they are excellent, but because influential people are averse to change and because of the sheer burdens of transition to a better state. You know, being here at a university, I'm sure many of you have encountered different levels of that. You know, it can, it's difficult to really transform an entire, say, university or discipline overnight. Many people have been working on this for 10 to 20 to 30 years, and it takes a lot of energy to move that forward. And it's not because of that there's lack of agreement that this is where we should be heading. And so thinking of some of the downsides of output-driven recognition systems, so you know the fact that most jobs, you get the security based on the papers that you publish, about your record in that regard, the grants that you bring in. I don't, I'm, I'm a big fan of Dilbert. So if you can't see it in the back, it says, I didn't have any accurate numbers, so I just made that one up. Um, you know, studies have shown that accurate numbers aren't any more useful than the ones you make up. You know, how many studies show that? 87, right? So, you know, there's still a certain element for how we rate researchers' footprints on society. I mean, essentially, their reputation that is still, you know, not consistent across different data sources, despite the fact that it should be based off of tangible outputs, right? I mean, there's a lot more that we can and should be doing. And so, you know, also looking at some of the ethical issues here, you know, because we've been able to, and this is shifting, but been able to get around so much of this by kind of cutting corners so we can just get the paper published and we can move on to that next big advance or that next grant or that next responsibility, you know, there's greater reward and more temptation to bend the rules. And that's not always necessarily because of negligence or, or malice. Many times it's just the nature of trying to keep up with the demands for these research disciplines. So what we're trying to do at the Science Lab is really leverage the power of, web, of the web for scholarship. And let me explain a little bit more about what I mean by that. So thinking of web-enabled research, I know we speak a lot about open research, so you know, thinking of means of increasing access to the content and the data and the research and the code but also thinking of it as you know, the emergence of web native tools, the fact that you know, not only is there an increased amount of software, but also there are a, a, there's things that allow us to interact with bits of hardware, you know, thinking back to that HPC example I gave you before, that would otherwise you know, have been significant expenses to our research lab or an entire server room that you know, we'd have to keep somehow cool in the summers you know, in part of our building. But thinking of the ability now to work in those more distributed environments and have more accessible tools across, the, across these, this work, as well as rewards for openness, focus on interoper, interoperability and collaboration, all of these things that can help move things forward, um, push for return on investment, some of the broader arguments that are made on the policy level to help move these forward from university levels as well as through funders and journals, et cetera, and as well as a focus on the computability of our, our, of our work, you know, that, that reproducibility element, and also the transparency and focus on reuse. And so thinking about what do we mean by open research, we went through an exercise a number of months ago at the science lab to think about, okay, well, what broader values? I mean, Mozilla is all about the values that they apply, not necessarily being prescriptive and saying a system has to abide by all of these different components, but what are we aiming for? knowing that the work that we do at the Science Lab is working with developers and various groups that within universities and librarians and publishers and funders, and not everybody has the same makeup, and that's part of the beauty of it. But thinking of on the community side, also in terms of the tools and technology as well as practices, 
focusing on things like having the work that we do be discoverable so that other people can uh, go forth and not only know that it exists so they don't have to reinvent the wheel but also be able to build upon it. You know, use of open tools, things like focusing on sharing, reuse, data management, which if any of you are um, federally funded at this point, you might have had an increased push in the last few years to make sure that there are data management plans included in what you do. You know, documentation and versioning. I know with this being a software engineering and CS group, um, many people here probably are familiar with at least some sort of version control system, you know, whether it's Git or using GitHub, the, the web component of it, um, mercurial or uh, subversion, finding a way that we can better track the work that we do so we don't completely lose it if you know our hard drive uh, fritzes out. As well as looking at some of the broader community components, you know, having mentorship and recognition, citation even as a form of recognition. You know, how can we actually focus on building our reputations and providing incentives for researchers to want to participate in this sort of fashion? And so these are just some of the initial things that we've put up. I'm happy to have a conversation later about things that might be missing from this or that you'd like to see instead. Um, but wanted to give an example of this to show you some of the um, some of the problems that we're battling. So in the biological space here, there was a number of years ago, it's been about five years now, uh, since the National Cancer Institute, the federal level, had a project called CA Big, and it was a cancer bioinformatics grid. Uh, you know, enables the continuum of molecular medicine. It brings together all of these fantastic things like, you know, work in basic research, clinical, um, having tissue banks and means of accessing materials that you could use to advance work. Focuses on imaging, all of this cutting edge science. And you think about it, it was a six-year project. Over $350 million was spent. 70-plus tools were created as a result of this work. That seems like a, a real advance in what we're doing, and especially having that be partnering with other research universities around, um, around the US as well. But when you think about it, and thinking of, again, that reward system of rewarding the wrong behavior at the sacrifice of you know, scientific progress, we're still cutting corners. And I'll illustrate a little bit of that throughout the talk, going back to that example with CA Big, which was shut down in 2010 after an assessment based on some of the things we'll discuss today in this talk. But you think about, um, for example, looking at the time of publication and when data is released. The most dreary one is the accident one in the middle part there, as well as death at the end. But you, for most of it, a very small amount of the data that you collect during your research is released when you publish. The majority of it is either kept on hard drives, hopefully still within that researcher's, uh, researcher's lab or within their computer or their hard drive or, or cloud storage. But more of that starts to leak uh, over the course of time. You know, I can imagine that if many people here went back and asked their colleagues for some of the work that they did five, seven years ago, there'd be bits of it that might be difficult to retrace those steps. It's kind of the equivalent of going back and trying to detail to someone perfectly what they did yesterday from when they woke up to go to sleep. You know, it's, it's, it's difficult to do if it's not annotated and saved over time. And what we're dealing with now is that it's really difficult to go back and be, reference some of that materials, especially if someone wants to go and build upon your work that may have been a couple years in the past. And thinking about where the ideal space to operate is. You know, I'm more so thinking about moving towards that top quadrant, about having the, the code and the data available so that you can go through and recreate the experiment. You can validate the results. You can see where you'd like to build on from there. Um, and figuring where else, you know, is it slightly suboptimal? I mean, it's great to have the data, but if you don't have the code to be able to run it, that can be a significant hindrance and vice versa. One of the things that we're trying to minimize is this black box in the middle here about then a miracle occurs. You know, up to 70% of research from academic labs, and this is largely focusing the life sciences, cannot be reproduced. I mean, that's a, that's a real problem, especially since most of this is publicly funded and should be publicly accessible and also is in many cases being applied to work that could help for, say, disease research purposes or in terms of health, right? That starts to present a, a real, real bottleneck there. And I think the, the bottom, if you can't read it in the back, says I think you should be more explicit in step two. And so what can we do to better document some of those, uh, some of those methods as we move forward? 
so that we can minimize some of the wasted money, the wasted time and resource and opportunity because we're still seeing significant amounts of that in the research groups that we're operating in. So going back to the CA big example, talking about waste, um, over 60 million was spent just on management. Um, and one of the quotes here from, there was a group that was convened to go forth and, and assess the, um, the success or the progress of the project in 2010. And he said, you know, we're used to billion dollar software and it's not what we can afford. You know, I'm worried that unless we rein in our expectations, we will do this experiment again and we'll get the same result. And the same result was that it was not meeting the needs that it was originally scoped out to do. And so thinking about how we can start to really make what we do more efficient and apply some of these thoughts from the open source world, from software development, um, to really update some of the researcher hygiene practices here. Most of the researchers that we work with at the science lab are based in you know, life sciences, in the physical natural sciences. Uh, they are sometimes in digital humanities or social science. They're dealing with significant amounts of data. They're dealing with environments where, despite the fact that they um, may be studying as a biologist or a neuroscientist or an ecologist, uh, the, their environments and their workflows are becoming more computationally driven. And they're not necessarily getting the exposure to some of the courses that I know from talking to some of the students today, you're getting as sort of an intro to software engineering or intro, uh, intro work in that regard. And so trying to figure out how to provide those supports to researchers who are needing to introduce efficiency as well as some of the means of capturing information so that it can be shared and best documented. Um, what, are the, what are the right mix of putting those things forward for researchers so that we can really push those best practices forward in a means that's meaningful to the people we're working with. So some of the examples of what we do at the science lab is really focusing on when we say science should work like the web or on the web or for the web, really unpacking what that means. You know, I know that some people here have a focus on web development, but when it comes to what Mozilla offers to this and thinking of the manifesto, which, you know, I encourage you all to go and look at once this talk is done, the Mozilla Manifesto, but what we stand for, of really thinking about you know, the broader interpretation of some of the things that we associate with, you know, the, with the internet and with the web. So when it comes to having systems that you know, we don't need to necessarily build a monolith, that we can have a means of plugging together various components and using that to advance what we're doing, you know, we like to think of the Unix philosophy here. Uh, Ken Thompson, who created uh, the B programming language, raise your hand if you have worked in the C programming language. Have an exposure. But thank you. Good. Phew. Sometimes I don't have exposure to, you know, the software engineering students, and they just stare at me I'm like, "What do you mean B and C? Is there a D?" You know. So, um, but really, this idea that writing smaller modular components and being able to plug those together, rather than needing to build and also maintain huge monolithic platforms for research. You can move more quickly, it can be more adaptable, and also with research advancing so quickly, it's, it's more flexible for those environments. The majority of scientific software uh, groups that we deal with, um, we've seen a transition recently, but the tendency to want to build the end-all, be-all, catch-all system for all problems that you may possibly have for research. It often leads to a significant build, and by the time it comes out, it's at least two years behind the needs for that community. And significant expense, as well as not necessarily even mapped to the needs. And I know I was speaking to some of the uh, faculty this morning about even just doing requirements, uh, requirements assessments to be able to better understand what that's, what that's needed. So we like to think about what can we do to help get groups to work together that wouldn't otherwise work together, to understand that you can plug together a lot of the bits of technology that have already been developed and exist that people don't necessarily know how to do that, um, or apply open technologies to these problems as well as do so in a way that puts something forward the community can take forward and also you know, continue to reimagine as things move forward. So one of the first pilots that we've had, uh, and again, looking at what we can do to bring together the open source community, bringing together developers, as well as uh, some of the mo more domain-specific researchers, was we ran a pilot around um, code review. 
And it was written up in Nature. We worked with the Public Library of Science, which is an open access journal, um, and PLOS Computational Biology. And we took snippets of published code. Uh, these were biologists, largely, not necessarily scientific, uh, or not necessarily software engineers. And we put them in front of Firefox engineers. And what we realized was that that conversation point was too late in the game. It was too late to have anything meaningful necessarily come out of it where it could have influenced their work. But what we did realize was that there were a number of different um, social issues that emerged about having there be a uh, safe space for that dialogue for researchers to admit that they don't necessarily you know, have necess all the right answers when it comes to their programming and working together in teams to be able to advance that, almost emerging some like mentorship models out of it. We, our second version of the pilot was more so focused on working in teams and having some researchers who had more of programming experience work with those groups. But the main thing that we were able to see there was just the dialogue and, it, you know, I, you could go through and annotate someone else's code and you can get in an argument over which sort of brackets they're using or spacing, but we really wanted this to be more broadly about the directive of what they were trying to do and make that a very positive experience. Um, that there was still a lot of fear that by admitting that you didn't know something, it would ruin your reputation. And so, you know, trying to see what we can do to help hack the cultural barriers that oftentimes are what's really stymieing what we're doing in science. Our second project was with GitHub. Uh, I know many of you here have, have worked with GitHub, even some of the faculty, um, to bring GitHub and also Figshare, one of the data repositories, uh, open data repositories together, as well as working with the community and some libraries to think of what does it look like for code to be seen as a research object. So a research object in the sense that in recent years we've seen you know, with data repositories, making the data available separate from the scientific paper, you can start to see, you know, uses that may be outside of just the limits of the scientific paper and also be able to get credit, be able to see how that percolates through the scientific, uh, the scholarly research system. What can we do when it comes to code? When it's, whether it's reusable or if it's being run in a separate thing or it's being used to build off of. Uh, and so what does it mean to cite code, to have that be something you can get credit for distinctly, treating it as if it is a piece of content, treating if it is another piece of data, where you started to see some of these cultural norms evolve. And so you can find out more at that, um, that bit.ly shortened link at the bottom, and I'll make these slides available at the end. Um, but, you know, we crafted a means of essentially linking the two APIs. So again, this didn't need any special permissions. This was all openly available. Anyone could have done it. And created a browser extension uh, and just a bookmarklet that allowed you to push your code from GitHub to Figshare. And Figshare and another repository called Zenodo, which is run out of CERN, again, going back to the Higgs boson, um, they, automatically, I, they automatically assign something called the digital object identifier, which is the same citable endpoint that you see at your journal articles, that dx.doi, the persistent identifier that is often used and picked up by various um, citation counters as well. And so what we also did was we had a conversation with the research community, we kicked it open to them, saying, all right, if there were five things that you could make available or could have detailed for a piece of code to make sure that it would be usable by someone else, like what are the five things that you look for? And this follows on from the life sciences, something um, when it comes to minimal uh, information and metadata standards, um, something called MIBI. There's a whole collection of uh, standards there for you know, detailing biological systems of varying degrees. And so seeing what we could do to, again, bring some of that connotation, people from the open data movement that had been part of those conversations that may have not wanted, had any base in software engineering or in terms of scientific computing, getting them to come and be part of that conversation as well. So this project is ongoing. Um, you can see here, this is a snapshot in Figshare. You can look, and they have built in, just in their own system, views and downloads, and they're um, looking at, you can see at the bottom here, here's a citable endpoint for that piece of code. You can start to put it together in file system, so you can start to better organize some of this information. And it was not in a, designed in a way where we wanted to create product. You know, frankly, the best minds are kind of outside of the, our walls, but we wanted to be able to show what was possible and to start that conversation. And then we also are building up ways to help increase discoverability. So this is ongoing now, looking at using JSON for linked data. 
Um, you can see here the way that this is detailed. You know, you can look at the context, you can look at the author. It's got all the basic information on the uh, underside of this, as well as looking at the ID at the bottom, second to bottom. Uh, it's an open author ID called ORCID. So we can start to plug this into existing bits of infrastructure so that ideally, um, as this project evolves, and this is something that's on our uh, docket for this year, if you've got different data repositories that have similar means to be searched across, then you can start to not just have to go to Figshare to find all the Figshare data and to Zenodo to find all the Zenodo data and this institutional repository to find all of that, but you can start to search across, getting more towards what we think of when it comes to federated systems and the web as well. And this is something that we were in discussions with the National Institutes of Health about with the Software Discovery Index. There was a meeting that was held last May, um, and we're still looking at seeing what we can do on a federal level to start to bring together the various parties to prototype, to not develop a big monolithic piece of, of software. The NIH has a tendency of doing this, um, but instead to start to show what we can do to experiment. And so stay tuned on that front as well. And the whole idea here is that the open iterative development that is so known when it comes to open source, applying those bits of process to scientific research and creating, again, those safe spaces around work in progress are really beneficial. This is an example of some of the workflows and interoperability for CA Big. You can see it's a bit clunky. I'm not going to expect you to read anything that's on here, but just knowing that you know when it comes to simplifying this and the whole idea of, uh, was it the KISS methodology, the keep it simple, stupid? Um, trying to figure out what we can do to help clarify this to move forward. And going back to the CA big example, um, Andrea Califano was leading the group that was assessing all of this and said, you know, instead of cancer driving the development of technology, it was the development of technology that drove CA big moving into the position where this technology could be adopted by individuals who were interested in cancer. So you can see how not doing that right sort of information gathering at the outset and $350 million was spent over the course of six years, how that can really flip things and make them, you know, a little bit more destined for, for failure than success. And, you know, their approach to fulfilling their mission was upside down. And ultimately, the project was shut down. Um, going into another aspect of what we do with the science lab, you know, it's one thing to have, you know, the means of engaging groups when it comes to technology. It's one thing to be there as a community resource, but really thinking about what's keeping us from adopting um, these practices and putting them into motion. And so thinking about our practices, you know, thinking of what we've discussed a little bit so far about these infrastructures for reproducible research. You know, we've got the tools and the practices and the software. We've got the social capital about pushing things like recognition, you know, promotion in 10-year committees, um, advances in that regard, interdisciplinarity, et cetera. And then focusing on some of the capacity there. So how can we start to build out those mentorship models, professional development, new policies, et cetera, that can help, you know, ease the movement through that system as well, and also make it more sustainable. And thinking of some of the infrastructure layers we've spoken about, you know, there has been a shift from hardware to focusing on the software, as well as working in more distributed settings, working in more, um, you know, even on the Mozilla side, focusing on having your development be through the browser so it can be accessible on a, a wider scale, and also through mobile. And now looking at social as an infrastructure layer to help build, you know, linkages through these other areas too. So going back to the web-enabled science, which we spoke about at the beginning, you know, thinking about what's missing, you know, how do we foster a sustainable community of practitioners? Researchers, faculty, librarians, etc. You know, back to Dilbert, uh, rethinking professional development here. We are facing researchers, again, that are dealing with more computationally driven parts of their work, but also focusing on the data as an equalizing force across. Um, the last bit here is the main thing about, you know, do I have permission to fake the test data? I didn't even know data can be real. Um, there's an underappreciation for the work that needs to be done to train researchers to, ha to handle this, not only scientific code, but also, more importantly, in many cases, the data in a means that can not only advance their own individualistic research uh, or on an individual level, but also then be there for others to build upon. And so thinking about what we can do to help boost that training, knowing that you all have a very full schedule when it comes to your undergraduate and graduate work. 
So we work with a group called Software Carpentry. It's open educational materials. Uh, we've currently uh, work with over 250 instructor, instructors around the world. These are researchers from undergraduate all the way up to full-time uh, faculty and professors, um, varying disciplines around the world. We've got 60 more currently in training, and we're piloting various live instructor training. And we've reached in the past year over 5,000 participants through two-day workshops teaching things like Bash and Unix, Git and version control, Python or R and SQL. And it's not necessarily trying to teach researchers how to be programmers themselves, but more so to give them that awareness and almost literacy so that they can communicate with someone who might be, say, in your department to be able to advance their work or to be able to have a jump start where they can start to add some efficiency into their own work. Um, but that's not all. And Two days of work doesn't leave you uh, necessarily with all of the tools that you need to be able to shape and reshape your, your work going forward. So we work with a number of other programs. Um, there's the Open Science Training Initiative, uh, which is run by a colleague in the UK out of Oxford. There's a School of Data, which has lessons about data analysis and data munging um, from the Open Knowledge Foundation. Uh, data Carpentry, which is a spin-off from Software Carpentry, as well as our Open Sci, which comes from a number of ecologists that have been working to create some of these materials for open research, but focusing on the programming language R. So we find Python and R are the two most commonly used. But beyond that, we are also looking at means of bringing together the community to identify other ways of advancing their learning. So one of the big gaps that we have, and we just got a grant to build this forward, is to figure out once you leave one of those trainings or initial sort of event, there's a huge gap to becoming proficient enough to go forth and become an instructor. There's a lot of technical, uh, technical training and, and skills you need to beef up to, for that specific model to go back and train your peers. But there are other things when it comes to reinforcing certain uh, lessons you learn by teaching them to your neighbor, right? Having a small study group of, of sort of activities. And so we were just uh, down in Australia for the first ResBAS. If anyone's read The Cathedral and the Bazaar, that's where this was pulled from. Um, the Research Bazaar, it's run by the University of Melbourne. And we're working with them to help extend that to other groups around the world in running instructor trainings and then back to back the next week a broader event for the research community. And this, we had 200 researchers of varying levels from across Australia and New Zealand um, that were learning about you know, NLTK for the humanities, R, Python, um, you know, some data analysis, et cetera, as well as learning about open research, community building, working in the open, and participatory development. And so that was one of the activities to keep things moving. And we also are running local and global sprints to bring together the community that might not necessarily want to solely be involved just in skills development, but also get their hands dirty. And so our next global sprint is June 4th to 5th. Um, the one that we ran last July had 22 cities around the world involved in uh, two days of sprinting. Some were just individuals that logged into a video chat. Others were rooms of 15 to 20 people. And these were not only working on technical projects, but also working on educational materials, running trainings, getting people engaged in new data analysis and examples and capstones. And we also have a, um, a means that we're testing to run local code sprints separate from those bigger events each year, as well as a place on our, um, on our site where researchers can post their projects for others outside of their discipline to contribute. So getting back to the way that Firefox was created by having you know, additional space for those around the world to contribute and also having clearly defined tasks that people could drop in and feel like they were helping move something bigger forward. Um, we wanted to help test some of that out. And so some of the projects there from working with pathogens or on badges for contributorship with journals, biological materials, site escape, et cetera, um, those you can find in the collaborate portion of the site. And the main idea here is that you shouldn't have to be a wizard to use the web. You shouldn't need a computer science degree to use the web. I also really like Legos. Um, you know, and how we can lower barriers to entry but not lower our expectations. You know, some of the things here about building capacity, also recognizing that not everybody learns in the same fashion, so providing an opportunity for them to become leaders within their communities and mentors as well, and not just build individual nodes. Lastly, you know, shifting practice and getting it to stick is challenging. Um, these are some takeaways, at least I like to say. 
There was a research, uh, a research exercise, it happens every 50 years, called the International Polar Year. It was a, formerly known as the International Geophysical Year. Um, there's, I highly, highly recommend going and reading more about it because there's some significant discoveries that have come out of these uh, bursts of data collection. They're two years long. Um, this year is known as the honeycomb diagram. You can see on the bottom and the top, you know, looking at earth, land, people, ocean, ice, atmosphere, space. You can see it's crossing research disciplines from the life sciences, physical, natural sciences, um, those that are working in climate research, others that are looking at local and traditional knowledge of communities and various areas affected by some of the, um, some of the polar work as well. And the main thing there is that, you know, this was an effort in the past was 2007 to 2009. I was fortunate enough to be involved with it when I was at Creative Commons. And there were 63 nations participating, over 10,000 researchers and 50,000 participants. Can we do the same for, for science on the web? You know, finding a means where, you know, not everybody needs to speak the same language, not everyone needs to be doing the same research, but there's at least an umbrella in which this work can move forward that we can start to have some interesting means of moving, uh, moving research towards a common goal. And so the International Polar Year has its own issues. Uh, there were some data collection um, efforts that should have probably been put into place before they started the project, but you know, live and learn. But thinking about how we can start to collectively work across different groups and, and not be necessarily as siloed as we are today. And so what are the necessary components for pushing this forward? You know, we've talked about many of these um, tools and technology, shifting awareness, the social issues are some of the biggest, as well as open dialogue across these various communities from groups like here, as well as bringing those lessons to bear on some of the work that we do with more specific um, scientific disciplines, as well as focusing on incentivizing researchers so they feel as if there's a reward there for them to not only learn themselves, but also to pay it forward. And thinking now that we're starting to see, and this was uh, you know, the work of about five years, of the benefits of sharing information online. We had a lot of skepticism when we started talking about the benefits of open access and open data. And we're now starting to see things that we can point to, such as this about sharing research data actually increases your citations and increases your ability to get recognition in your communities. And we're gonna be seeing more of this as well. So a couple takeaways. You know, bake those reproducible research practices into the fabric of research. It shouldn't be a nice to have. And, you know, if you're teaching a child about how to go through their everyday work, if you teach them how to clean their room when they're 15, you're probably gonna have some problems. So see what you can do to introduce that earlier on in the process. Um, and really think about that open iterative design so that we can unlock the potential of the things that we're creating. It's a lot of effort that goes into them. You know, the technology's largely already there, but look, keep an eye out for those sorts of examples that could help really advance the work of others. Rethink how we can reward researchers. This is a big one. You know, don't be afraid to hit refresh. Uh, I speak a lot to university provosts and deputy vice chancellors about ways that they can also help move this forward, that it's not just coming from the researchers. And you know, be mindful of jargon and semantic traps. You know, framing things as just open science can often make people think that if they're doing closed science, they don't necessarily want to get involved, right? And so having an open dialogue, not being afraid of thinking of characterizing something in slightly different terms so that your peers feel like they can be included in that movement or included in that, in that work is often really helpful. And we're here to help. Um, we've got a number of different ways of, uh, for everyone here to get involved, and we would love to hear more about the challenges that you face. So feel free to get in touch with us there as well. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Can you raise your hand? We'll come by with the mic. Uh, very good talk. Um, my main concern is how much, especially with your background on CC, how much are you pushing the license speech into the users of these tools? Because uh, every time I hear, I hear about open something, I think about GitHub's disaster, which was a great setback for uh, free software and open source when they just forgot about the license and now we're 
trying to reach back to people that publish code that is just out in the air without any, and same, same thing may happen here with the code that we as researchers would publish without a license, then somebody will modify that, then who knows if that was legal or not. And is, 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 is the science lab taking care of that? Uh, so taking, taking care of in looser terms, um, there are set, uh, set licenses for both content and code and data, or for not both, but all of content, code, and data that we suggest to the community, knowing that it's not always going to fit every scenario, but knowing, uh, so on a, on a flip side to build off of what you just said, looking at the way that, say, the open educational resource community came into being, it was many of those decisions for what licenses were made available for researchers to choose from before, say, some of the work that we were doing around advocacy so people understood what those different licenses would do and what remixing those bits of content would do. And so if you look at even things in the linked data movement or even an open educational resource repository such as like OpenCourseWare, you know, use cases such as pulling together different resources to create a virtual textbook, by the nature of some of those licenses, you almost end up with something as restrictive as full copyright by the end of it, just based on those building off one another or like share-alike provisions. And so we try to, you know, the guiding principles that we apply for this and leaving it to the user to decide are suggesting licenses and means forward that are not only in line with, say, the open access movement and um, the open data movement, but also are getting it to be less friction on their side, so they don't need to necessarily go and deal with a lawyer to understand their rights over a bit of information or being able to reuse it, make it even simpler for them to move forward. And so we you know, recommend Creative Commons attribution license, which is in line with open access for content, for data, you know, CC0 or CC BY, which is putting it as close to the public domain as possible. Um, for code, thinking of uh, the BSD license or the MIT license, which we found gets the, you know, either the viral component or as, as well as the commercial component out of the, out of the way. But those are just our personal, um, personal views. I will tell you, my colleagues at Mozilla are big fans of the share-alike provision because that really came up in, from the open source and the free software um, side of things. And I am not a fan of share-alike for science because just having seen in the past 10 years the advances in, say, bioinformatics where doing a search across 40,000 endpoints was something that only a few researchers could do with significant resource to now something that pretty much everybody can do. Um, it is still unclear to me what the repercussions are for having you know, a viral license attached to one piece of data in that mix. And so my, my personal um, preference is to make it so that we're not limiting innovation following on that. What do you feel the role of funding agencies like NIH is in this, and do you feel like they're doing what they need to be doing? So we work closely with funding agencies, not only in the US and the UK, but also in Europe and Australia and New Zealand, to, um, to find ways of exerting pressure in a positive fashion on this, and so when it comes to not only getting them up to speed on some of the different methodologies when it comes to, say, you know, software and data, but also looking at what is the right mix for um, spurring engagement and awareness when it comes to public access policies or when it comes to mandating, like the National Science Foundation recently put into place looking for other research products, so code and data and patents and things like that. Um, so we work very closely with them on that. I think that there's a there's an ability for them to f wedge the door open for conversation that we saw from the open access, um, the open access discussions over the last eight, nine years that I think they can really move things forward when it comes to data and software as well. And so working closely with them but also with researchers to make sure that there's not just forcing uh, certain information to be made available and no support level or support at the level of the researchers, so we can pair that together. But we work closely to help advise what, where we see those trends going and also trying to make sure that they don't put up additional barriers and make our work much more difficult.
So um, <clears throat> I guess the two components of what you've been talking about today are the technological barriers that um, like poor code or lack of plugins or whatever, and also the cultural problem of a community that just hasn't been into open. Um, going forward, like to meet your goals, do you see more cultural problems or technological problems? Definitely cultural problems. Um, because we're starting to see sort of shifting awareness and a lot of the tools that already exist are there to meet many of the problems that have been identified. I think the main things on that side that still remain are uh, challenges around discoverability. So for, you know, I'm in a very fortunate position because I'm outside of the system and I'm paid to observe, right? And I'm paid to see where we can start to pull things together. Most researchers don't necessarily have that same luxury in terms of time, in terms of um, access to know exactly what things may be at their disposal. And frankly, you know, we're not doing a great job of making it available to the researchers. So what can we do to help tie those together? And I think that that is a bit more of a social exercise because some of that is outside of individual research disciplines and some of those are outside of, you know, certain areas where people may look for those resources. So seeing what we can do to help build the community as a vector for making that easier, uh, I think is at least to me the more interesting bottleneck there to try to tackle. How would you start discussions with researchers who are still being introduced to the web and who, quote unquote, don't use email? Do you know people that don't use email? Yes. <laughs> in a uh, professional fashion, five uh, miles away from here. Interesting. How would I start the conversations about open research? About using the web at all. Science. About using the web at all. Uh, I think really understanding what we, uh, at least when we were crafting this program, I mean, people can apply various lenses to what we do. So there was a colleague that thought of it more as kind of a software engineering or an engineering problem. Um, I think of it more as sort of the behavioral science component. So thinking about what are the incentives and, and value propositions for the group that you're working with and trying to work within that system. And I think that that's you know, a lot of where some of the work around open science and framing it as, well, it's open or it's not science, I think falls short um, because it's you know, ignoring the realities of those systems and trying to work within them sometimes can get you a little bit more adoption and traction. So I think it would warrant a further inspection as to what really does move them forward or what they do see as the broader benefit um, to doing things in the way that they're traditionally doing and exploring whether or not there's a means of introducing, say, efficiency or, I mean, this is why even casting it to, say, pharmaceutical companies as, well, no, you'll get a higher return on investment oftentimes gets them just to completely go and, and toe the open science line in a way that telling them, well, reproducibility does not. This one in the corner? Oh, I think I was going to ask the final question, but maybe we'll, do we have time for more? Yeah, no. Okay, yeah. Okay, so one quick question. Um, so you mentioned working with the federal agencies, and, I, and of course many of us know about the data management plans, for example, that NSF is asking for. Um, I know from being on panels that we're, panels are being asked to look at them much more carefully, and I think yet there's no real guidelines on how do you evaluate if, if scientists are sharing their data appropriately. So, so for example, it seemed, well, when I'm done with it or in three years, I'll release it. So I wondered if that's something you talk about or if some of the things you're already finding about um, more citations can mm. help that problem. Yeah, and I think that it's still, I mean, it, when you think about the broader timeline for research versus the work that we've been doing when it comes to open data and around data management, it is a small, small drop in the bucket of, you know, getting, I mean, there's still very little legal precedent, there's very little research that's starting to be able to show the, the rewards, and we're starting to see that near, uh, or turn a corner. But, you know, to what you were saying, for example, with the, well, in three years, I'll share it, or even with some of the federally funded, uh, like, translational research centers, groups that are designed to work across different universities, you know, if you, have, if you know someone's going to come in for a site visit that's going to affect your funding and stand over your shoulder and look at your practices to make sure that you're sharing your information, you 
you're going to straighten up at your chair and you're going to make sure that that's all. So is it like, is it an accurate representation as well? I think that the difficult component, and we see this on the educational side of what we do, but more so looking at mapping progress in terms of shifting practice is around assessment and finding ways where it might, we might need to completely rethink the method in which we do so. Uh, and so trying to figure out now, you know, beyond pre and post, you know, workshop surveys, what is the best way to be able to show if someone's practice is being applied or if this <laughs> training is being applied or if they're actually carrying that forward. There's different metrics that you can pull from different groups, but it's still really messy. So I'd welcome any suggestions that people may have for how to do that more effectively. Something that um, strikes me is that I'm thinking, I might be wrong, that probably researchers in academia are some of the people most likely to want to take these kind of approaches on. But very often, particularly I am thinking of postdocs people earlier on in their career that might be more willing to try these things, have a lot of mobility, they move. So things that might be um, part of a working group, they move on and disappear. How easy it is to involve others like administration at universities, but others in the scientific community, people in companies that collaborate as kind of leverages for them? That's a really good question. There are a number of number of groups that we do work with to try to make sure that we are not just, I mean, clearly the researchers at varying levels, uh, largely we're um, able to access graduate students and it means it's a little bit more so than undergrads because there's different constraints depending on where you are in the world. Um, but you know, the undergraduate to postdoc level, that's one component, but also looking at the decision makers in that space, oftentimes even tied into the infrastructure at the university, but more so looking at how they can help you know, open doors for other groups to be able to explore some of this in a more meaningful fashion. Um, we've seen a number of groups from outside of that in terms of broader companies. Um, a lot of people that when it comes to biomedical research are often able to serve as examples and leaders in that space, as well as bringing in others at the you know, deputy vice chancellor, vice provost level that may have a vested interest in trying to do something a little bit different than some of their colleagues. Or you know, over the course of a few years, we've been able to build up a few examples to show them this is something that there's an appetite for. Here is a way that you can lead in terms of your research. Again, to your question before, you know, figuring out what their incentives are. Oftentimes saying, well, no, you can be the first university in your region that does this. That can open some doors, too. But it's really important as well, because if you don't have the buy-in from other groups, I mean, we're about to launch a fellowship program in the next few months which I'll, I can talk about afterwards if you want. Um, but in launching that fellowship program, a real concern of ours is, well, if we have a student that wants to carry this forward, what if their advisor, what if their university isn't necessarily the right environment for them to, um, to, to work autonomously over the course of 10 months? And so we have to involve them in that discussion. We have to have you know, a certain amount of trust that there is an environment there for them to thrive. And I think that some of these other additional organizations are helping to provide use cases and, and discussion points that can move that forward, too. Okay. I guess that's a lot of time for talks. Um, <laughs> questions, people can talk later in the reception. So please, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And please accept this gift oh. as a token of our thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And then, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming to the talk today and invite you to join Caitlin outside for refreshments and ask any additional questions. As well as ownership for that experience to users. So it's not uh, another large tech company that's dictating our experiences on the web. Really this idea that the internet and the web should be ours, that we should have the ability to really make that into something that is better suited to our needs. So in the last five years or so, Mozilla has existed for quite some time, but in the last five years or so on the foundation component, or on the foundation side where I work, we've been looking at various use cases, whether it's in 
data journalism and in news, and the Knight Foundation is heavily funding some of the work to explore how to apply some of these principles when it comes to the web and the connectivity and accessibility and openness that comes through it, um, how to apply that to that community to help advance those initiatives, as well as looking at ways that we can shape education and opportunities for youth. And so the icon that you see there next to the Firefox logo is a program that we have called WebMaker that looks at ways that we can bring together cultural learning opportunities, after school programs, things that can get kids making on the web and also outside of classrooms to help further the ability for us to push things like digital literacy and that environment to them beyond. Now, why would Mozilla get into a space like science? The Science Lab, we launched that back in June of 2013 um, with some support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Uh, if anyone here listens to Radio Lab, the podcast, uh, you may have heard Alfred P. Sloan Foundation cited. I see some smiles in the audience. Um, and the work that we were brought in to do was to take the identity of Mozilla, not necessarily as just a software engineering organization, but more so as one that has really pushed forward this idea of open source, of open innovation, of building out best practice for the community, of really instilling these values into everything that we do, both in shaping the technology that we use in our everyday, uh, everyday lives and also professionally, but also to look at what we can do to help heighten involvement and engagement. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Caitlin Thaney. Caitlin is director of Mozilla Science Lab, an open science initiative for the Mozilla Foundation focused on innovation, best practices, and skills training for research. Caitlin is an advisor to the UK government, serves as director for Datakind UK, and is the founding co-chair for the Strata Conference Series in London on Big Data. Today, Caitlin will present Making the Web Work for Science, in which she'll discuss how we can better work together to advance the mission of more open, collaborative, web-enabled science, and how we can influence the culture of science by demonstrating new and open ways to conduct research on the web. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Caitlin to the podium. Caitlin. Good afternoon, everybody. So it is a distinct honor and pleasure to be at RIT. Uh, I know some of you who I've met with this morning know that Rochester is my hometown. Uh, we grew up not very far from here. So it's a real pleasure to be here to speak to you all about some of the work that we do at Mozilla. For today's uh, discussion, I really wanted to look at not only some of the thinking that we've applied in the last year and a half, a little bit more than that, to create the science program at Mozilla, showcase some of the things that we're working on and ways that we're trying to further engagement when it comes to bringing the open source world and research world together to learn together, but also then to open it up to a, a dialogue afterwards. So please feel free to save those questions. We'll have some time at the end. But to give you a little bit of background, Mozilla is more commonly known for some of its work in the browser space. Um, in the bottom, bottom corner there, I don't know how many people here have ever used Mosaic. Show of hands. Come on, we're in a software engineering. OK, we've got a couple there. Uh, so Mozilla has its uh, history rooted in one of the first web browsers, Mosaic. That's where the M-O-Z comes from, though Mosaic is spelled slightly differently. Uh, and really looking at how we can start to weave in disruption, but with the advances with the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope being able to get to petascale astronomy. I mean, this is so much data that even astronomers that are, even, that are up to speed with some of the latest technologies are trying to figure out new means so that they can make most use of that information. And my favorite is in the bottom right-hand corner, really trying to democratize this entire process not only through advances in citizen science, really getting research not only outside of universities, but also into hands of people around the world that may not otherwise have access to it. You know, really having those distributed forms of data collection and analysis and also communication so that the way that we understand the world, and to me that is really at the heart of what research is all about, that that really is being not only communicated, but there's a participatory element there as well. And we've seen this with synthetic biology, we've seen this through other citizen science efforts, um, even now being carried up to levels such as the National Institutes of Health and the White House as well. And the web has really helped transform this. I don't need to 
tell the audience here that in the last you know, 10 to 20 years, our experiences online have changed, right? I mean, I don't know when was the last time anyone here used uh, the yellow pages to try to find something online or thought twice before purchasing something and looking at the rating system that had been pulled together by not only various stars, but reviews, et cetera. You know, the way that we interact in educational, uh, educational environments as well as just even knowledge discovery has rapidly transformed as well as accelerated in a way that the web has really helped to, to add. And we've seen advances in power, performance, and scale. A lot of the work that we do in, uh, at the science lab and communities that we work with are, many of them are coming out of high performance computing where we have increased resources to work in distributed environments and also with much more power. And so thinking about what we can do to continue to apply that to various areas and, and really acknowledging the fact that these advances were something that didn't necessarily even exist in a way that was accessible to broader research groups out. Um, for those around the world. And focusing specifically on applying those values to scientific research, where we are still seeing, despite you know, even my own personal work for almost 10 years in this, we're still seeing significant bottlenecks that are keeping us from advancing scientific research in a way that the technology should have pushed us, pushed us past long before. And so our work at the Science Lab is to really support communities where they already exist, I mean, I'm sure that you know, many of you have been either aware of or involved in some of the advances when it comes to open data, both within the sciences and outside of it, for open access, some of the tool development, scientific software. There is a myriad of different projects out there that are really pushing these things forward. This is not a new idea by any stretch of the imagination, but finding a means to help collectively move that work forward so that we're not creating additional bottlenecks and, and roadblocks for each other is something that we strive to do at the Science Lab. And I'll tell you a little bit more about it, but to give you a bit of background as to some of the areas in which we're working, Focusing originally on you know, the fact that this is a really cool time to be involved in science and in research. I mean, you've got from the top left-hand corner, I mean, discovering the Higgs boson, being able to process significant amounts of information to be able to even look at some of those anomalies in the data and, uh, and doing that at a level that CERN has um, with the Large Hadron Collider. Um, we've got in the top right-hand corner, um, you know, efforts to not only sequence the human genome, which seemed really revolutionary even just a few years ago, but being able to have research collaborations that span over 400 different uh, scientists and excessive amounts of information to be able to look at better understanding um, our, our genomes itself. And even in the bottom left-hand corner, looking at the advances in astronomy. The new telescope that's being built in Chile, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, is going to bring us in, I believe, 2019. They keep pushing the date. This happens in science quite frequently. I'm sure many here have you know, had shifting timelines uh, outside of certain pockets five to 10 years ago. But for all of those advances, our current systems are designed, unfortunately, to create friction despite their original intentions. If you think of when scientific publication began in 1665 with the Royal Society's Journal Philosophical Transactions, the, in the initial idea behind it was to be able to write down your work and to be able to share that with your colleagues and with your peers. It was a knowledge sharing system. Even things like citation and indexing was a way of categorizing and organizing information to help make things more efficient. And then humans got into the process. And competitive interests started to layer into that, dictated by things that are very, very in innately human, you know, funding, job security, et cetera. And so what can we do to help move that forward? I like to think of it as the current state of science as a clogged calcified pipe. Don't know if any of you remember like the Drano commercials where they showed you that really kind of nasty pipe in the, in the mix. You know, when we first started, when I was at Creative Commons a number of years ago, looking at the, the state of research and, and working with a number of different scientists across dis different disciplines to say, what are the main stopping points for your work? Everyone thought that just because they saw Papers were still being published, patents were still being filed, data was still being generated. As a real success, that the system was working. Outside of realizing that some just have a fire hose at the beginning of that pipe. 
you know, when it comes to having more funding to be able to throw at that, that doesn't mean necessarily we're doing things as efficiently as possible. You know, and looking at the outputs, there is still a significant amount that we can be doing to build that, uh, build that better. And one of the quotes that I like to reflect on from Cass Sunstein, who's a, a legal scholar, but also has been looking at scholarly communications, uh, is that traditions last not because they are excellent, but because influential people are averse to change and because of the sheer burdens of transition to a better state. You know, being here at a university, I'm sure many of you have encountered different levels of that. You know, it can, it's difficult to really transform an entire, say, university or